problem of late middle age to early elderly. Um, so that you can expect as people get older the complaint of widespread pain to increase in prevalence. <coughs> now who makes the diagnosis? Well in our country uh, it's interesting about referral bias because patients get sort of sent to rheumatologists when they ache and they complain of joint problems and about a quarter to family uh, physicians and complex or treatment resistant cases are treated by people like us, physiatrists, psychiatrists, or neurologists. Uh, and the best outcome follows early diagnosis and management by a primary hair, a care provider. But the problem is, at least until those um, uh, Lyrica ads started hitting the television, people never knew what they had and the diagnosis was really delayed. <clears throat> so, um, early diagnosis is critical. One of the problems, though, with uh, patients going to rheumatologists, is they're not trained to manage pain, they're ma trained to manage inflammation. So, this is what happens when you add FM to rheumatoid arthritis in terms of disability, and it's pretty stunning, except for the uh, fact that joint uh, a replacement, there's no difference, but every other variable that you look at, social security, current disability, work disability, those with FM are substantially more disabled than those without it. <clears throat> and the clinical characteristics obviously are pain, fatigue, so there's some cognitive problems, sleep disturbance, stiffness, depression and anxiety, uh, impaired uh, physical function, and comorbidities. And I'm going to um, show you a slide on comorbidities right here. Where the blue are the non-FM patients and the red are the FM patients. And we're not surprised to see that depression is uh, increased. Uh, but look at the painful neuropathies significantly more, diabetes significantly more, and sleep disorders significantly more. Um, uh, so this is an ailment that really is not clear in terms of what its relation to other illnesses. And I was, I've been very in interested to, to follow the story about the increased rate of autoimmunity because of, uh, in, in a small study of people with Sjogren's, 20% at FM, and uh, uh, in another small study of people with Hashimoto's, uh, a third had FM. So, um, I always am thinking of Hashimoto's when I see patients with FM uh, and, and, and uh, evaluate them and really use the TSH. If the TSH is sort of in the uh, uh, upper third, I'll do autoantibodies and often find them. <coughs> so uh, this is pretty straightforward. Um, the, the thing you want to know of is if it's primary or secondary. Secondary is obviously comorbid with rheumatologic disease. And these are the tests that I do. Um, Sjogren's, again, is a, uh, an ailment that can really uh, syndromically overlap with fibromyalgia uh, in that it produces fatigue and pain. So if patients report uh, a lot of dryness in eyes and mouth, and part of my entry exam is actually a Shermer's tear test. Um, so these are the tests that I do. Um, I'll often uh, consider uh, uh, doing a CT scan to rule out ankylosing spondylo spondylitis and the sleep study if the history warrants it. So these are the risk factors for developing widespread pain. Uh, female gender, overweight, lower socioeconomic status, Prior history of somatic symptoms. So then, in other words, someone who's, uh, as a young person, had a lot of illness or illness complaints. Uh, prior history of depression and limited physical exercise. So here's the basic phenomenon of uh, fibromyalgia. That when I press with a, if I were to press a tender point on you uh, with uh, four kilograms, uh, let me just find the controls, yeah. I'd be able to do it and uh, you would say, well, okay, if you press with four kilograms, that's a, a pain level of a 12. Uh, and if I used about a two kilogram, 
uh, pressure, you'd say, well, that's a pain level of a two or three. But if I pay, press the tender point of a fibromyalgia patient with a two to two and a half kilograms, they'll say it's 12. So they, and as a matter of fact, they frequently won't let me go to the full uh, four kilograms. They'll say, stop. So they're very tender with reduced pain thresholds. Now, is this a peripheral ailment? Well, looking at muscle has not been, or really looking peripherally for any uh, possibilities have not paid off. Uh, spectroscopy have failed to identify differences in energy metabolism or susceptibility to activity, and there's been no evidence of histochemical uh, or abnorm molecular abnormalities in things like substance B or 5-HT in the, um, in, the, uh, in the muscle. So the other thing is, could it be cent uh, central? Well, one thing about uh, substance P, just mentioning it, is that substance P is elevated in spinal fluid in fibromyalgia patients over controls. And these patients are not just sensitive to pain, but they're also sensitive to, other ex to, uh, to various other uh, experimental nociceptive stimuli like noise or other uh, things like pressure or shock. Uh, they don't inhibit um, uh, to painful stimuli as normal people, and I'll show you some data for that. And there's enhanced brain sensitivity or sensitization, if you will, to repeated painful stimuli, as well as exaggerated brain response. And I'll show you some data from my lab on functional imaging. So here is DINIC, diffuse noxious inhibitory control. And what happens in DINIC is that you apply a painful stimulus like um, a tourniquet and then you apply a second painful stimulus and what happens in a normal person is that uh, with, uh, when you apply the uh, second stimulus uh, you get a, an actual increase in pain pressure threshold. Okay, so this goes up. This is what you see in a normal person, that you administer a painful stimulus, then you put an ischemia on, which is a second painful stimulus, pain pressure threshold goes up. And we don't see that in fibromyalgia. So they fail to increase their pain thresholds. So this is a, 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 a taken as, a central, uh, as, a, as evidence of central uh, sensitization. Now, um, functional imaging takes advantage of magnetic moment of deoxygenated blood. And let me just sort of, while you're looking at this slide, show you what's happening in my brain now. So as I'm doing this activity, the BET cells in my right area are firing. And as they fire in that little area, the ratio of a deoxy to oxyhemoglobin changes and the imagers can pick that up. So the, they look at the ratio of oxy to deoxy, and that's why you, you're, you want to usually do an on-off uh, 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 paradigm. So in other words, what you do in the, in the earliest functional, uh, 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 functional neuroimaging, uh, you would have people, uh, they'd flash a light at you for a minute and then stop flashing, or have you go like this for a minute and stop doing it. So on-off. So fMRI has identified a number of brain regions uh, uh, associated with pain processing. These are data from uh, my former fellow in which we're using a warm stimulus, not even a painful stimulus, and we see very little activity in the brain, uh, a little bit here in the RAFE, <coughs> in the uh, healthies, and just a lot of activity throughout the brain. This, this uh, brain looks like this would like the controls would look if I applied a very painful stimulus. So the, um, so the patients act as if the stimulus is greater than it actually is, which supports the central sensitization hypothesis. So let's talk a little bit about genetics. Uh, there is a family predisposition. First degree relatives of FM patients have a large increase in FM and smaller increases in depression and anxiety compared to those of RA patients. 
So there is a family predisposition. And the genes that have been looked at are all of these. All of these seem to be associated with pain disorders. And I want to talk specifically about the, la uh, well, actually, I'm going to talk first about the serotonin transporter gene, where there's an increased uh, prevalence of this short, short allele. And the short, the S allele is also of interest because it shows some overlap with depression. Uh, there is a lot of comorbid depression in fibromyalgia, and the S allele is known to sensitize to stress-induced depression. The loveliest work done in genetics, though, in these medically unexplained syndromes is, um, is some work done in temporomandibular joint dysfunction. So this is a, uh, where they look at COMT haplotype. So look at this fascinating study. The reason they studied a temporomandibular joint disorder is that its prevalence is about fourfold higher than FM, about 12%. Again, predominantly women complain of pain or jaw open and or jaw opening problems. So this is a neat study. So they took 202 pain-free women from 18 to 34, and they assessed their, their pain phenotype using these three methods. And basically, they got a bell-shaped curve uh, of low pain sensitivity and high pain, pain sensitivity. And then they uh, did genetic polymorphisms to, to see whether there was a relation between this and between pen sen pain sensitivity. And they got, I think, very, very interesting results. If you look on the left here, uh, they found that the incidence of TMD developing was about two and a half fold higher in the, in the uh, young women uh, that had the uh, uh, haplotype that was high pain uh, or average pain. Okay, so that, that that haplotype, if you had it, that was predictive of a two-fold increased risk of developing TMD. So that is a very interesting uh, and is the cleanest genetic, a piece of genetic data for any of these unexplained illnesses. Let's take a look at tri illness triggers. Well, peripheral pain syndromes, uh, infections, physical trauma has certainly been associated. Uh, there was an, a study out of Israel where uh, they looked at trauma in the factory and leg trauma was not, uh, uh, and trauma was certainly a, a predictor for the development uh, of fibromyalgia, uh, rarely following vaccine and certain drugs. So the mechanisms, first let's take a look at the relation between physiologic and psychologic function. And here we really um, uh, have uh, a range from the neurobiological, which we've been focusing uh, on uh, to date, uh, in this talk, abnormal sensory processing. I haven't talked about these, but I will touch on hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal function as a possible variable. But you all know, or should know, when you're doing pain management, that pain and psychosocial factors go like this. And so if there's issues going on at home, uh, if there's distress, uh, if there's psychiatric comorbidity, uh, maladaptive illness behavior. All of these things are like turning up the gas uh, under, the, uh, uh, under the pot. So um, an approach to pain management cannot just be focused on procedures. It has to be focused really on the patient and the patient's story. Um, so patients display a normal detection threshold. That is, they can feel touch normally, uh, the same as you and me, but as I've shown you in that earlier slide, their noxious threshold is decreased. And it's not just to pressure, but it's to other stimuli, heat, noise, and shock, as I, I mentioned that earlier. And this increase could be psychological, they're, they're sort of hypervigilant, or it could be sensitization. Now these are some data indicating that um, these patients have a reduced hypothalamo-pituitary-adrenal response to stress. Uh, so, for instance, when you give them a, a hyperinsulinemic clamp, the ACTH is reduced. 
when you give them an acute insulin infusion, which of course produces hypoglycemia, which turns on the adrenal, things are reduced. So here, exercise, blunted cortisol, social stress, blunted cortisol. So again, it appears that the response to stress is reduced and that, and, and that this may play some role in the pathophysiology, although its role is not really quite clear. Now, how do we treat it? The first thing I do when I see these patients is I'm very sensitive to the presence of anxiety and depression, and uh, that is, uh, those are the first things I will try to treat with drugs at, or brief therapies. We have in our department now a woman who is trained, uh, a PhD psychologist, trained in managing pain, uh, the psychological factors, so I refer many of my patients to her. If sleep apnea exists, obviously we'll treat that with CPAP or a dental prosthesis. What a dental prosthesis does is it pulls your jaw forward. Uh, and then we'll use standard of care treatments for any of the chronic illnesses. And the cr uh, critical thing is to realize that treating pain is not just pulling your pen out of your pocket. It really is three things. It's pharmacotherapy, general physical conditioning, and cognitive behavioral uh, therapy to overcome fears of increasing activity. And CBT focuses on somatic, in these patients, unless they have major psychological issues, it focuses on their somatic rather than their psychological concerns. So let's quickly go through my algorithm for treating FM. And I start with the anti-epileptic uh, drugs. Uh, pregamblin or gabapentin. Uh, and what I usually do is try to treat, um, I, I will try to put patients on two drugs that are, have a different mechanism. So I'll start them on gabapentin, neurotin, because it's cheap. Uh, if that's not a problem, I'll use pre, uh, pregabalin or Lyrica. And then I'll often go to uh, one of the drugs on the next line, which is either Lamictal or Trileptal. Lamictal, you have the only worry about Lamictal, uh, it's a drug the psychiatrists use for mood stabilization. I find that it helps in pain management, is that you have to start with 25 milligrams and ask about rash because this the only I've never had the problem, but Stevens Johnson has been reported, and so you need to be careful. That problem doesn't exist with the oxcarbamazepine. Uh, but I do use Lamictal. And then I move on. Uh, again, the base, uh, depending on insurance and uh, budget, uh, will I start with the uh, TCAs? I don't use cyclobenzaprine, but I do use the tricyclics. And um, this real quick just shows you that uh, gabapentin actually uh, did better uh, in reducing pain scores uh, in a meta-analysis of eight trials. Slides out of order, sorry. Uh, so here's the tri here's the tricyclic uh, data. So the um, ones in yellow are secondary amines, and amitriptyline's the only tertiary amine. So uh, uh, these um, tricyclics are known to reduce pain in FM. They were the first drug. They and Flexerol were the first drugs reported to improve pain. Uh, I use a lot of amitriptyline in patients because they often have sleep problems and uh, the sedative effect uh, is rather marked. So I will do that. But if the side effects, like the cholinergic effects, are too much, I will then mix amitriptyline with this, uh, dizipramine. So I'll give someone 50 milligrams, say, of amitriptyline and 25 of dizipramine if I want to get the total dose up. Um, so, uh, but if uh, that's, if, if insurance is not an issue, I'll go on to duloxetine, and there was a recent study showing that uh, nearly 70% of duloxetine's effect was independent of any effect on depression. So that's a very interesting drug that does, that has two modes of action. It's an antidepressant, and it's a pain uh, managing uh, uh, management uh, tool. I tend to use the anti-epileptics rather than the SNRIs uh, unless there's uh, evidence of depression. If I get any whiff of mood, even if the person does not fulfill criteria for major depressive disorder, but I do, um, I give all my patients uh, a, a little sheet of paper 
uh, called the Centers for Epidemiological Study Depression, which has got 20 questions and really tells me how they are right now. And it's been normed on medical patients. Uh, I find it very useful. And if the scores are in the depressed range, even if the person does not have, quote, major depressive disorder, then I would use the SNRIs. <coughs> and milnasopran's a little harder to use because you need to ramp it up and there's a lot of problem with nausea. Uh, it also uh, probably does have the same antidepressant effect as uh, duloxetine, but it's not approved for that. Um, and then the last uh, ones are sodium oxabate, um, Zyra. Now that's a very interesting drug. Um, it's heavily controlled because boys were giving it to their girlfriends to knock, it, knock them out. So it was the date rape drug. Uh, uh, and so when you tell a patient that, they, oh my God, I don't want to take that. And you have to say, well, you know, you're at home, you're taking care of yourself, you don't have to worry about it. Obviously, you have to explain it. It's a liquid, salty preparation that is really, really a good sedative, very short acting. I like it because it improves deep sleep. Uh, it has not yet been FDA approved for FM, but there are a couple of uh, successful trials, and I think they're on the uh, short track for approval. Uh, so I like that drug, uh, and I've helped a number of patients with it. And then, of course, in our department, using long-acting opiates, and I'd say about 15% of my practice, maybe a little higher now, since I'm a tertiary care provider, are on opiates. So uh, obviously, these are the things we're going to talk about. We've talked a little bit about pharmacotherapy. I want to just uh, touch on uh, exercise. Uh, aerobic conditioning at moderate intensity uh, likely improves overall well-being and physical function. So this is my mantra. Uh, patients um, become disabled. They, be they reduce their activity because it hurts to walk. Uh, as soon as they start reducing their activity, they go through a process of deconditioning with more symptom generation. And it's very, very hard to get buy-in. And that's why I use um, CBT, actually, to help people be more positive about walking. Because we know that in every medical illness, be it congestive heart failure, COPD, FM, if you can get people to improve their aerobic capacity, they will feel better. So strength and flexibility training helps. Uh, not, uh, well, certainly not all patients tolerate exercise, but I'm talking about activity for starters, not exercise. Someone who's really not doing very much, I want to see them walking for 20 minutes a day at a slow pace. I, you need to get past 20 minutes to 30 minutes because 20 minutes is the point of aerobic conditioning. And when they're at 30 minutes, then you can actually start thinking about aerobic conditioning. The good thing about FM is these people can exercise if you can get them over their pain and discomfort. And one of the things you have to think about is uh, swimming and uh, aquatherapy. So this is Getting uh, FM patients to do this is an important part of my practice. And uh, you see in this slide that aerobic, uh, the, uh, these are the exercise folks and the controls. Aerobic performance uh, got better and tender point threshold improved uh, So uh, in this uh, meta-analysis. So again, it works. Uh, it works at least as well as medicine. And then finally, cognitive behavioral therapy. Have any of you been taught anything about CBT? You have. Social worker. But you see, this to me, um, if, I were, if I were teaching, um, I really would be doing, teaching you how to do CBT. Because CBT is probably um, the most important technique for compliance. When we see a patient for 15 minutes, um, 
we're not going to get good compliance unless we're able to build a strong doctor-patient relation. And CBT is, uh, is, is not necessarily building a strong doctor-patient relation, but it's working with patients to in, uh, teach them how to reduce their symptoms, to increase coping strategies, and to identify and eliminate maladaptive illness behaviors. So it's um, effective for nearly any, uh, as I said, chronic medical illness. And not all CBT is the same, very dependent on who the therapist is and how the training is. Uh, so this is the Im uh, improvement noted with CBT versus standard care in terms of physical functioning. Uh, CBT is, not, is something which can take a year to learn, but I do believe that uh, uh, physicians can be trained a simpler version of it uh, called motivational interviewing, uh, which will help you get substantial compliance uh, with, your, uh, a medic, uh, with your plan uh, for treatment. So I wanted to just tell you about a study that I uh, did. Uh, this was an NIH-funded study in which we um, implanted a vagus nerve stimulator in the, le in the vagus in the, in the neck. And these were women who went through my algorithm of treatment and failed. So they were on at least one anti-epileptic drug. They were, they'd been trying on an SNRI. They'd been on Ultram and or opiates, and they still had substantial symptoms. So we then uh, implanted a vagus nerve stimulator. Now, why would we uh, think about VNS in, um, in FM? <laughs> well, we were very uh, interested because VNS is FDA approved for depression and epilepsy. And when you think about the medicines we use for FM, they're anti-epileptics and they're SNRIs. So there seems to be some commonality. Plus, there was... Um, a study, a, a couple of studies done on pain thresholds on individuals who um, were treated with it for depression and pain thresholds uh, went up. Okay, so that, so there seemed to be uh, improvement. So we used the same stimulus pa uh, parameters as used in those illnesses and basically the stimulator comes on for 30 seconds every five minutes around the clock. So this is, um, uh, this study that we did was not controlled. It was a uh, tolerability study. So when you feel something, that's a very strong possible placebo stimulus. But I want to give you the uh, outcome. So two, uh, there was no difference in tolerability despite having uh, these patients having substantial pain. And during the one-year trial, two patients wanted the uh, device explanted. So this very busy uh, uh, graph, which I sort of like because you, 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 your eye sort of follows things, shows that a number of patients didn't show much improvement, but a number of them did show some dramatic improvement in terms of the number of tender points. Now, when you look at the literature on tender points, uh, none of the drugs... Um, Deloxetine, Lyrica, none of the drugs produce a reduction in tender point. They produce a, a reduction in uh, self-reported pain. So we thought this was a very, very dramatic uh, effect, and we were impressed by the fact that in some patients, the effect seemed to occur more and more over time. So this was a first study, and now we're trying to get the funding for a follow-up study with a control limb. So, um, and this is the psychophysics uh, that we did in that study, where the left-hand bar is before uh, we, uh, this is after implantation, but before the stimulator was turned on. And you see the biggest effect is at, uh, is at four months, but there is a consistent down effect whether we use, uh, w what we're doing in the psychophysical uh, testing is there's a patch put on the volar surface of the arm and it randomly delivers a, a, a rapidly uh, uh, developed heat uh, uh, between 43, 44, and 45. 45 you would feel as just becoming painful. Uh, and you see that what happens here is that the pain intensity at, 40, at 44, let's see, 
uh, tends to resemble what we might expect in normals. This is still higher than what we'd see. In other words, what we're seeing here is we ask the patient uh, at, uh, when, when they get this 44 degree uh, heat uh, um, stimulus, how painful it is on the 0 to 10 scale. And you can see a significant improvement in the psychophysics. So we think this method, uh, that this really supports it not being placebo, and we're excited by it as a new adjunct therapy for treatment-resistant patients. So to conclude, um, their, uh, their new these new approvals offer options for treatment. Uh, brain targets are proven to be effective. Treatment must be individualized. And the integration of these various treatments, uh, that is exercise and CBT with the pharmacopoeia that we possess, is the best approach. Any questions? What's the name of that 